Hello. <laughs> How are you, Richard? I'm doing well, thank you. How's everything? I'm very good. Wow. You are like me. Really? You are on time. Yeah, I like, I like to keep the time. <laughs> very good. Very good. Wow. So how are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Just uh, trying to, you know, it's a busy time with yeah. working on master's dissertation and all of that stuff. So it's, there's a lot of stuff going on. Yeah, there. yeah. So, so what's, your, what's your master's dissertation topic? I am still trying to decide. I've had yeah. some different ideas. I keep changing. So <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not 100% sure at the moment, but hopefully yeah. by next week, I should have a topic. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. so of all the conflicts in the mm. world, which one are you looking at covering? Oof. I don't know. There's, there's, so <laughs> many, there's so many interesting ones, honestly. Yes. I don't think for my dissertation, I'll actually talk about um, okay. conflict. Okay. Um, because I feel like there's so much, there's so much more to explore mm. outside of conflict. Um, but yeah, like I said, I'm, I'm not hundred percent sure. So I'll, I'll, I'll take maybe this weekend to really fine tune my topics and then okay. see. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's interesting. Okay. Now in this conversation i would like us to explore some of those things that you you think it's important for us to know you know mm. uh i was excited when you told me you are doing your master's in com conflict mm. uh it's uh because uh it's something we as africans we really need to talk about mm -hmm. and we don't talk about it enough mm -hmm. you know so richard let's start Introduce yourself to my audience. Tell them who you are and what you do. Okay, so my name is Richard Nzeku. I'm currently, I'm a Nigerian, currently doing my master's at King's College London. Uh, I'm studying international conflict studies. I did my undergrad in Northeastern University in Boston, in the US. Yeah. And I studied international affairs with minors in French and psychology. And... After my undergrad, I worked as a career coach for migrants and refugees. So that really exposed me to, you know, the humanitarian world and it really exposed me to migration issues. So I developed a keen interest in that as well. And I also started a YouTube channel called Rich Perspectives, where I talk about culture, travel and self-discovery because I'm a very adventurous person. I like to explore new places, yeah. meet new people. So it was the perfect medium for me to combine my love of international relations and also adventure. Yeah. See, I got to know about you through your YouTube channel. Mm. And uh, it was uh, very interesting because you, you, cover, you cover a lot of different topics. Yes. Okay. And that's good. I like that. Now, you are studying conflict okay now like i like we said it's something i think we as africans need to talk about because uh there are some major conflicts on our continent uh and as long as we are not i i see let me not assume okay the guys in power uh i i let's say they are doing their, 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 their duty, studying these things, talking about these things. But uh, the results of their studying or talking, we don't see. Hmm. Okay? Because, hey, look at Sudan. Uh, what is going on? Uh, the conflict brewing between Egypt and uh, Ethiopia is there. Nobody is talking about it. Okay. And there's so many other intra country conflicts. Okay. See, for me, I think one of the main reasons why we are we having we having those so many different conflicts is because of our diversity. Okay. We are so diverse in uh, 
language, culture, that unfortunately in the past, in the past, uh, this kind of diverse peoples are integrated through wars in the old days. Thank God uh, we now have countries, okay? Although we still are still diverse and I don't want, and I don't think we'll have so many wars to integrate us, but we need to be conscious of our differences and, and, be, and consciously decide to understand ourselves and to work together. Now, do you think we are doing a good job of that? Well, it certainly, it doesn't seem that way a lot of the time. Um, as you say, I mean, I would agree with you that a lot of the conflicts within the continent are, they have identity and difference at the, at the base of all of that. And it, it really doesn't seem as if the governments are doing a good job of trying to dialogue. You know, I, I think intercultural dialogue is a very crucial part of international relations. And you would expect, you know, that they would definitely be engaging in that, which they do to some degree. But when you see the frequency with which a lot of these conflicts spring up, especially you don't even need to go, you know, internationally, just within certain countries, yeah. In the continent, a lot of civil wars and unrest, it's all because of, you know, tribalism, differences in religion, amongst people that are supposed to be citizens. Mm. You know, um, some will, you know, bring up the role that colonialism played in that by, you know, just meshing all these different groups of people together and saying, okay, you are all one country, you have yeah. to go along. And definitely that has played a role. Yes. A lot of tribes or groups that you could say had no business really like <laughs> interacting so to speak have been forced to do that and you know you wonder in the absence if colonialism had not they happened okay what would have happened? <laughs> <laughs> see see that is something that many people never ask themselves if this didn't happen mm. what will we be doing right now yeah yeah yeah, and it's a, it's a it's a tricky question. I don't think we have the answers to because okay. we, you know we're only speaking. But, but we need to explore. We need to explore mm. them mm. to see to ask to ourselves: Are we in a better place to start dialoguing mm. to ensure that our differences doesn't lead to physical conflict? Yeah, because yeah. because we ha we have the opportunity. Mm. we can decide okay we are here we are together okay if we're not merged by the corona powers what would be what would we be doing right now mm -hmm. and if you look at it throughout history what tribal groups do is fight mm. okay there are very few tribal different tribal groups that integrate themselves through lobby dobby <laughs> action no the fight mm. the stronger one would dominate the 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 smaller one the less able ones yeah. and if you take hundreds of years of subjugation be before they come now become a, 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 a group mm -hmm. and then they go ahead they go ahead to fight other groups mm -hmm. and that's what that's what happens human nature <laughs> yeah that's that's what we have done for thousands of years mm -hmm. okay see it pains me that many of us do not think about all this. Mm. You know, it, it pays me. And, uh, and, 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 and I'm sure when our conversation is posted, someone who listens to it will tell me, they'll give, give me excuses 
why we should not talk about it. And as long as we don't talk about all those things and dissect it, we'll continue fighting ourselves and wasting our time. Yeah, I, I would agree. I, I definitely would agree. It's something to, not only from a history of, you know, the perspective of knowing your history. Yeah. Um, I think it's also important to understand the role. History plays a role, even in policy. Yeah. Whatever policies you want to make, it's always important to understand the historical background so mm. you can sort of see the trajectory of things. And it, it can definitely inform the decisions you make if you want to improve a situation. Yeah. I mean, imagine, I mean, take Nigeria, for example, a lot of tension in the country now, you could say you could trace to tensions from the civil war. Mm -hmm. If you want to and make be, and be before then. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So it, it would almost be foolish not to take those sorts of defining events into consideration when you're trying to move on. Yeah, if that makes sense. Yeah, you, you can. So in the same way, this colonialism uh, conversation it's definitely important to keep that at the back of your mind. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's the aspect of, oh, you, some people will say, oh, how, how long do you want to dwell on this topic? You know, you should move on. I've heard different sorts of views. Yeah, but yeah. It's, good, it's always good to have that information at the back of your mind to really understand how the world has, the events have played out over the years because Africa is where we are for certain reasons, not just colonialism, but colonialism has played a role and it would be foolish to ignore that. Yeah. Now, I I don't tell I don't tell anyone anyone not to talk about it. Okay, but I I my argument is how we talk about it. Mm. Okay, what perspective do we have when we talk about it? Okay, like we just talk about now. We never say see everything I've heard. Africans and allies of Africa talk about colonialism has always been negative. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't see colonialism as always neg negative. Mm -hmm. Like we just talked about, if we're not meshed together, okay, and colonialism didn't happen in Africa. Unfortunately, right now, maybe, see, because of our diversity, we have so many different tribes in that continent. And to integrate us, the only way human beings have known is fights. Okay? So, so I see that aspect as positive, okay? Now, I blame us, us as Africans, that, okay, we have emerged, okay? And we know the differences. I say we know. Uh, actually, I, I, I contend that we don't actually know the differences between us because people are talking and, I, and I, I've talked to a lot of young guys who want one Africa. I don't, I'm, I'm not opposed to that, but I, the, I, my argument to them is this, before we start saying one Africa, we need to know ourselves. We need to know about uh, our neighbors. We need to understand them. We need, to, we need to know the, the differences and similarities between our cultures because people outside Africa assume, okay, that Africa is one, one big town. No, we are very, very different. Okay, we are very, very different. And we need to acknowledge that if we really want to move forward as one people, 
there is, there is a massive need of integration. And you can't integrate until you understand what differences you have. That's my argument. And uh, unfortunately, people who don't listen to it will just assume I'm saying something else. Okay. So, yes, we are where we are. But for me, for us to move forward is for us to do the work. I mean, what do you think? I would agree. I think there's, um, you know, you could say all that has already happened. Mm. So now what? You know, okay. you can't just st sit and keep saying, oh, colonialism, colonialism, colonialism. Mm. What are you going to do next yeah. to progress? And that I would agree with. I would say that there is a there is a duty we have. And, and it's a, to me, actually, it's quite shocking that we haven't progressed more, you know, because and, I, and I'm not sure why that is, because a lot of leaders that we after the whole continent has had, a lot of them have they have good knowledge about the, the impacts of colonialism and what the world order was before. And you would imagine in an ideal sense, if you're willing to move forward, you're in the leadership position that you will put a lot of lessons you've learned or your family has learned into use to move forward. But it seems like we just keep getting stuck in a cycle of recycling, you know, the same leaders who for some reason don't seem to really pull their weight in office. And I don't know why, I don't know why that is like what makes let, let, let me suggest something. Mm. We don't teach history. We don't. Yeah, I would agree with okay. that as well. We don't teach history. And secondly, unfortunately, many leaders use their little knowledge, I say little, because yes, it's, li it's little, little, to their personal advantage mm -hmm. to keep members of their group on their own side and against the other group. Mm -hmm. So they are using knowledge of history to promote their tribal agenda. Mm -hmm. And now when I say tribal, it's not, it's not about ethnic, ethnicity only, any, any kind of tri tribal uh, group, okay? Either political or whatever. And that's what I think I believe many African leaders have been doing. See, you say you, you, don't, you don't understand why we haven't moved forward. I believe we haven't moved forward because unfortunately, we have had some good leaders, but most of our leaders have always had their personal agendas. Mm. Yeah, I think yeah that that makes a lot of sense. I mean, it's it's a pattern that we see all too. It's a pattern, yeah. So yeah, something needs to change on a you personal know. level. Yeah. See, if if we have taught history correctly, see, and what what is the correct one? Just tell the story as, as it is, as as uh, mundane as it is, without embellishing. Mm -hmm. Okay, just tell it and let the next generation look at it, think about it, and decide what they want to do with it. With, with mm -hmm. it. Right now, I will tell you, I, I know history because my father uh, taught history and I have always read a lot of history, okay? But we ha I wasn't taught enough of history in school. In fact, I, I think one of the things we need to do in our education, education system, that's a different topic. And that's, that's a big one again, <laughs> is that I think we need to 
teach history as a compulsory subject. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not elective. Mm -hmm. You, 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 you do history up to year, year 12. I mean, that's my thinking, mm -hmm. you know, see, some, some of our leaders think, oh, if we tell them what happened in the past, they will, they will start fighting. No. See, the reason why people will fight is because you don't tell them what happened in, in the past. My, that's my thinking. Mm. You know? Mm. Yeah. Uh, last, last weekend uh, was a... Was a a scary one. Yeah. The mutiny of uh, the Wagner group in Russia. You know. See, uh, <clears throat> when I was watching it on TV, I was saying to myself, wow, what is going to happen to the current African countries that have members of this group in Africa. And thankfully, the mutiny ended within a day, but that question still looms. What will happen in Mali and uh, is it a Central African Central Republic? African. Or what will happen? What's your, th what's your thinking? To be honest with you, I, I really don't know because th this whole this whole uh, mutiny or coup attempt, whatever mm -hmm. you want to call it, it some a part of me questions the authenticity. Okay. <laughs> Seriously, because I'm, you know, like I've learned in international relations and, you know, politics, not mm. to be surprised by anything. Okay. Especially where Russia is concerned, you, you also never know, you know, and for, for something like that to start and end in a day, mm. I'm asking myself, what really is going on here? Like, was this a legitimate thing? Or, you know, like, who knows what was happening behind the scenes. But assuming that it is, you know, it did happen, you know, and it has, in fact, been stopped. You ask yourself, um, firstly, with the war in Ukraine, like, how is that going to impact things? Mm. I don't, I don't really, well, I mean, I, I have read reports that the Wagner group made, they made a lot of gains in Ukraine in, in yeah. this war, you know, and, and these are the dangers of having a sort of what would you call it like these covert military operations which yeah. are not exactly you know part of the state officially but still kind of are there's always a danger of them turning against the state mm. it's just you know and the the reasons uh Prigozhin was citing for this was that you know the he didn't feel like the russian defense ministers had wagner groups back at all they weren't really they were basically letting them die that was his yeah, thinking, you know. So you ask yourself the, the the slant at which I look at this from is the psychological aspect of it. The soldier, the Russian soldiers that are fighting in Ukraine, I wonder if they're looking at this and saying, hmm, he did have a point. You know, we're all just dying here in this war, nothing has happened. What are we fighting for? You ask yourself if that's the case, you know. Yeah. And yeah. So, but to your question about like the African countries specifically, I have no idea what that even, you know what that means because I, I i always feel like whenever there's some sort of military intervention or military presence by foreigners in whatever country but in this context african countries mm. there's definitely this uh there's a power play involved naturally we've invited them to come because we feel like they have the resources we don't have naturally we've already put them on a pedestal to yeah. solve our issues for us if tomorrow they turn around and they say, look, we want to, we don't want to help again, we're at their mercy. If they somehow start fighting or killing our people, which they have, we're you also can't, you at can't their stop mercy. Them. You can't you know, stop so them. it's like, this is the issue that I have with our leaders just inviting these groups, think, again, as you say, for their interest in a lot of cases. Yeah. 
whenever they feel threatened, they start pulling all these people. And then with a mercenary group like this, they can do whatever they want because they're not exactly Russian state. So yeah. just, and yeah. that's, that's the danger of it. Yeah. See, uh, these kind of mercenary groups have, have uh, always been available. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at uh, how the British colonized most of the world. It was through private armies of companies. Mm -hmm. Okay. Before the British, British crown finally decided to take over the, the conquest of those companies. Okay. In that that would be the same thing in India, in Nigeria. I mean, I mean yeah. So these mess, mess, mercenary groups have always been, been available. But the, 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 my fear is that now they are so powerful. Okay, they are so powerful. They have available to them are uh, the best military equipment. And my biggest fear is that with uh, data being available mostly to multinational companies, they know almost everything about you, me, your local village, than anyone, including our governments, do know. See, and this this is this this is the the real thing, the real reason why uh, it was so easy for the European colonizers to colonize Africa. They know the region better than any of the, of the tribal groups in Africa. Then they know everything. Then now these companies know everything, yet we don't know one fifth of our continent. They know everything. And the people who have the information, we always win. Mm -hmm. See, my 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 guess, my last guess, that's what I told I told her. See, data information is more valuable than in any mineral we have in Africa. I'm telling you, information. So for me. That's why education is the is should be the number one thing that we should do if we really want to develop Africa. But I digress. Now, these guys are so powerful, and because of the data and the information they know, they have. They will still they, con they will continue being powerful. So how do we account for that? It's as if we are we are we are, we are putting ourselves in harm's way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's there's always there's always that danger. Like I said, any any time there's a foreign presence. You you know that it's not just a hundred percent. It's not just pure intentions. Oh, we want to stabilize the region and then we'll go. No, these these um, bodies they stay for a long time. time. Some, they never even leave really, because so far as you have, let's say even an embassy mm. of a foreign country, and that you best believe whenever the time comes, they can easily move military personnel. They definitely have undercover agents. They have you know, both overt and covert yeah. parts of military, the presence is there already. So you ask yourself, who really owns this country? You know, when a lot of these bodies are just there, they've always operated. Yes, they come as a peacekeeping 
missions, but we all know that is not the only agenda. And there's, they're also in it for their own economic gain. At the end of the day, whatever, if a country is willing to send an arm of its military to a different country, it is acting in its interest at the end of the day. Yeah. It may be there to help this host country, but at the end of the day, it is there for itself. It yeah. knows what it needs. That's what true. It wants to take. And that's already, that should tell us something, but I don't, we don't really pay attention to these things. We're just, I don't know if we're just used to seeing, you know, foreign troops on African soil and say, oh yeah, they're here to help. We need to look beyond these things. And I want, I question the leadership and what, whether they're ignoring that or as long as it's serving them, they don't really care about it. Or maybe they are, I don't want to believe this, but maybe they are just, naive maybe <laughs> that's scary <laughs> it, it is exactly again as you say back to education you know yeah yeah now on this note i will also say this foreign ngos are just as useful and deadly as foreign armies yeah See, now for me, if a foreign NGO has an agenda in Africa, for me, it's more deadly than an army, a foreign army, especially if what they do is education. Because if they have an agenda and they have access to the country's future generation, then you're giving them leeway to educate or miseducate that future generation. And I will tell you, I'm, I'm very scared of, scared of that. Mm. Because if you miseducate young kids at an early age, they will take all that miseducation all through their, their life to adulthood, and they will start implementing policies based on that miseducation. Mm. So for me, for me, it's uh it's dangerous. Mm. See, now am I saying that we shouldn't have uh, foreign entities, foreign NGOs? No. But what I'm saying is that we need to be aware of these pop possibilities. See, I talk about this, this sort of things and some people just think I'm just uh, scaremongering. See, I'm, I, I, I'm not one to be scaremonger, okay? But I, I like to explore possibilities about things. And I want people, young people in particular, to explore, research. And one of my favorites, write books and read books. Because if anything is possible, then someone is doing it. And they will be more successful at it if the natives they are doing it for or to do not understand this. You know? Yeah, I would I would agree. I would agree with that. I think also the um the as you say, this is not to say that any foreign bodies are you know they're all sinister they, they, you know there's no merit to their operations no but it's just 
being aware of the different possibilities because yeah. there have been in different countries not just even in africa across the globe yeah there have been examples of you know i guess you could call it indoctrination yeah as you know with these ngos or bodies as a tool for that and so you have to be careful i mean you you see in the news about you know the what china is doing in east africa mm. and some of the you know, there was that video that went viral about the, I think it was a school in a rural village, I can't remember which country, where they were, you know, they were teaching the children, and they were basically saying demeaning things about themselves. Mm. And I remember when that video came out, I, I don't speak Chinese, so I'm like, I'm relying, or Mandarin, I'm relying on, on, the, the, on the people the who understand, put. yeah. You know, so whether, let's assume that that was true, nothing was manipulated in that video, that's a very scary reality. To have foreigners come to your country and start and be and be teaching you exactly to hate yourself to say to, things exactly. detrimental to you, yeah, exactly. So th those are the sorts of fears you have to be careful about. It won't always happen mm -hmm. as overtly as that. It may be very subtle, yeah, and, you know, but it's still a way that is it still a power play at the it end is. of the day, and that's why I, I think Africa now, with everything we've endured as a continent and as a people. I think we're in a stage where we need to take power back for ourselves, not in an aggressive way necessarily, but just in in very little but very productive ways. We need to, starting with education, we need to really emphasize education because education is probably one of the most vital power, like senses of power. It's, it's see, I'll, I'll 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 correct this. Maybe see, it's not one of the. Is, is the <laughs> <laughs> is the okay yeah for me i i recommend everybody every young african must have 12 years of schooling every one of them after that you can decide what what you want to do that's your, that's your life but everyone should have 12 years of schooling and it should be com compulsory Okay. See, I'm not. A, I'm not. A, I'm not one to say government should do every everything. But when it comes to twelve years of schooling, yes, <laughs> I I I sanction that. You know. Yeah. 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 And it's, um, yeah. I think we we just need to be aware of different things, especially in the in this day and age where uh, information. Is, is is commodity yeah it's, it's the yeah. biggest one information is king and so with the way technology is going now and like i was talking about that video and how i'm not you know we don't know if what was put as subtitles is actually what was being said mm. Mm. um but there are so many different situations where people manipulate information for one agenda or another and people consume these things easily without yeah. even knowing without without it. even knowing yeah exactly and that's it's a scary thing as well it's like even with videos and deep fake technology people yeah. are, <laughs> you wonder how you know if these things are going to be responsible for wars one day because you can just put a deep fake on like a world leader or an important person and say something absolutely atrocious about another country or whatever then all of a sudden you have a national security disaster on your hands for something yeah. you didn't do you, you just wonder the the limits ai will push and technology as we get more and more advanced and where young people are concerned young people are there's a lot of fake videos i've seen and i've believed only to hear oh this is not even true and then you're wondering you just feel stupid at the end of the day but some people act on those videos and that's and, the and thing. that's why that's why i'm scared for mm. africans because mm. i see some some basic talking points on Facebook. See, I be, I, be, I belong to several African focus groups, and I see a lot of things that members of those groups post. Now, what I do, I don't go and tell them no. It's not no. no. I ask questions. And when I ask questions, maybe after the second or third question, the, the author of this post 
become aggressive mm. and start abusing. See, and I, I believe that those groups, okay, African focus groups with young Africans, with the kind of, um, the amount of things that people post, I won't be surprised if members of those groups are not real. Uh, AI or someone who is not actually interested in helping Africans. See, they don't, they don't need to be to to come here and say something so atrocious about anyone, but they just need subtle, subtle. See, just put a little bit of salt here, sugar there, consistently, and is to change the perspectives of people who read and watch their videos. Mm -hmm. And in one year, someone will go from here to here. And that's what I'm scared of. Yeah, yeah. See, yes. see yeah. future wars may not be battle uh, uh, tanks and uh, airplane, okay? It's just to change your mind yeah. and change your perspectives. You know, uh, it's it's interesting. Life is interesting, but uh, I I think because we are behind in development, we should take it more seriously to make sure we at least try to catch up before all this magical AI thing take control. Yep, yep. Until, if we don't do it now, in the next 30 years, uh, I, I, I don't want to think about it. To, to be at the bottom consistently with no way out. Mm -hmm. It's scary. Mm -hmm. See what I'm what I've told you today now. Okay, I I don't think I've I've ever talked about all these things with anybody. <laughs> <laughs> but I think about those things. That's what I do. I I like to think about different things and ask myself, hmm, this this this. Hey. Anyway, Richard. Like I, I said before, I discovered you, your channel, uh, Richard Perspectives. Rich Perspectives. Rich, rich Perspectives, yes, yes. And your, your, your videos are interesting. Thank okay. you. And uh, I've watched a few full video, mm. but mostly your shots. Mm. Okay. And uh, I like, Channels that explore different topics. Okay. Uh, so t t tell us your experience as a YouTuber creator. What inspired you to, to, to do this? And uh, how is it going? So firstly, I'll just ask you a question. Have you subscribed okay. to this? Yeah, channel? oh, see, <laughs> the first thing I did after I, 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 I saw it and I loved the, the content is to subscribe. Okay. Okay, okay I have, so I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a subscriber, yes. Okay, awesome. Um, well, I think it's, I started this channel almost, almost four years ago um, and I've been working on it on and off. Mm. It, I started it as a time where, at a time where I, I just felt I was just feeling uninspired. Really, I was I was still in the U.S. I wasn't really enjoying one of the. It was a period where I was just. It was a, a transition period. Yeah. So I was just like, ah, I need to do something more creative, because I love filmmaking. 
okay I watch a lot of classic movies black and white movies and you know I studied the film techniques and all that stuff and I love music and images so I was like I need to combine you know my love for travel and film yeah somehow and I looked on my phone and I was like I have all these pictures I've been blessed enough to travel to different places live in different places and I was like it would be so interesting if I could share my experiences in those places through the medium the medium of film yeah so I decided that's how I decided to start um as I started I realized and everybody at any YouTube creator would tell you if they've been in for you know for a while it's it's such a it's a difficult thing to do it's not as yes as <laughs> it's not as easy as people no think. it's not it's not you have to be very consistent mm -hmm. numbers. and that's something I haven't done because I I really it's not like I was doing this full time you know yeah so I would only make videos when I have time to do it and me I like to take a lot of time to make my videos because I'm very particular about very little details that the audience may not even notice so it just it, you know it stretches the time I'm putting yeah. videos out but I'm still very lucky enough that I was able to get monetized in the first year wow just lucky you that happened to blow up just one video and so it, I know I recognize that's not everybody's reality mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm just lucky that it happened that way. Uh, but I'm 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 happy with the rate of growth. And I think I can always see my skills improving. And sometimes I surprise myself. I'm like, wow, I'm actually good at this thing. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to, to keep going. And I always get good feedback. People are like, we love your videos. We love the cinematic style. Uh, not only the information, but the way you combine music and this and that. I'm like, you know, that's that's all I want to hear because that is like a creative outlet for me. Yeah, That's yeah. what I just love to, you know, to do. So it's, it's, it's been a good experience, but I'm trying to be more consistent mm -hmm. <laughs> to, get, mm -hmm. to expand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. See, uh, like, like, like we talked about, uh, education is uh, vital. Uh, and I would say, unfortunately, unfortunately, young people do not read okay even in this in this country the 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 rate of the 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 level of reading has declined okay they would rather watch uh, a video and in the last uh, few years they would rather watch a short okay even myself <laughs> in your in your on, on your channel i've watched maybe more than 20 shots but i've only watched maybe two full videos mm. now i still watch full in fact i watched three hour podcasts okay i do and that's because i love reading i love reading okay so i can watch a full length video documentaries and all that but my point is this Videos are now the, the best way to communicate information to young people. Okay. And I would like to encourage you to do more because that's the only, that's the best way for you to reach them. Okay. That's the be best way for us to reach them. Uh, I'm I'm just asking myself how we can convince Africans to watch videos where people talk about important things. Because what I've seen is that the the main African channels that have a lot of subscribers uh comedy uh tv shows in fact tv shows about comedy music okay or shows that that talk about a lot of angry people Okay, we don't like to 
listen or watch people talking about important things. Mm-hmm. I don't know why. <laughs> well, I know why. <laughs> See, we don't like to talk about anything important. And again, that's, that goes back to what, the first thing we talk, we talk about. See, if we don't start talking about things like this, if we don't like, if people in our communities don't like philosophy, you see, philosophy is, is a subject that to understand the depth of what is being discussed, you need to calm down. If it's a, it's a book, you need to read it, maybe read the chapter over and over and over. If it's a, if it's a, if it's a, a discussion, you need to listen to it and think about it over and over and over again. We don't do this. And see, now, I don't believe that uh, people from other regions hate Africans or Blacks so much that they sit down to plan ways to destroy us. No. See, people sit down strategize how to be better than the next group. That has, a, that has always been the way human beings behave, okay? But we are making it easier for them by not doing our own thing. See, there, there's so many, so much in very useful knowledge about the world, about society, available. And it has been available for 100, 100 years, yet very few Africans has ever heard about it. What, how do you think we can we can we can entice young people to start? Well, um, I think this goes back to what I was saying earlier about Africa being in a state where we need to take power back for ourselves. Um, because if you, I mean, we've talked about education, and I think everything just keeps coming back to education because it is that important. Yeah, but. Um, even down to the sorts of, and this isn't a, a, this isn't an exclusively African. Film. No, it's not. It's not um, the the content that young people consume, for the most part. As you know, it's it's not really the the deep things. It's more surface level things, and this is yeah. a generalization, but you know, it still holds. Um, stuff like comedy, as you mentioned. You know, I love I love comedy. Okay, and, you know, there's nothing wrong with these yeah. things. I just think it's the the amount yes. that, that young people consume, and you know, in comparison to like more the other important things. Yes, exactly. I think that's where the problem is. There's there isn't a balance, a healthy balance. Um, you know, you're. I, I know also a lot of young people are getting into entrepreneurship mm. um, because it seems like that is one thing that is really taking off these days. Okay. Um, and I think a, a bit less than the others, but like self-development mm. is also coming up, which I, I like because it's important to really pay attention to, to understand yourself and to want to always be better, a better version of yourself. So looking at, you know, in those categories that I listed, if you take, let's say, entrepreneurship or any other constructive, you know, fields that can really build a person up, self-development, all those things. That is a that is also a, a way of taking power back as okay. a continent. If you know, if you have Africans that are you know 
diversifying their interests, not just sticking to pranks and comedy and, you know, but also moving into other areas, learning more about themselves. That is taking power back because you're building, the character development is something that we probably haven't done enough of and which has contributed to keeping us where we are. Yeah. Wide scale. So by moving into these different areas, we're sort of building ourselves back up and you will find, I think it will be easier to educate people. And education is not just about pushing one narrative and having them no. agree, but it's about the ability to disagree and, and argue why you disagree, be able to have an opinion about what you believe. And if you are wrong and you've been proven wrong, having it, grace yeah. to be able to yeah. accept that yeah. and also be willing to learn more. And I think that's really how you take power back for yourself, okay. given all that we've been in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Uh, I like I like your ideas. Uh, uh, I hope uh, young listeners and watchers of this uh, episode would like would like them too. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah. Yes. Aha. Let's let's talk about this now. See, young people blocking traffic, pour, pouring soup on paintings and doing many simply annoying things in the name of activi- activism, climate change and others. You know, what's your view? Do you think that... Uh, young people should follow africans young africans should follow this model see i mean for me i have two teenage daughters okay my 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 oldest she's gonna be 18 tomorrow okay uh and we have been boxing (laughs) sparring in the last year and for me the basic disagreement i have with her is that she doesn't want well no one she doesn't try to convince me of her, of her position she just wants to tell me to the the her, her position and she wants me to accept it mm-hmm. which i don't do i ask a lot of questions and she gets angry and upset because i don't take her position and i ask her too many questions see this 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 kind of a uh, attitude it's what i've seen with many young activists i've talked to i've talked to some okay and when i when i push their their thinking they get defensive or they get aggressive so is this kind of active activism do you think do you think young africans should have those do this well um these sorts of acts like blocking roads pouring paint or soup on paintings all that kind of stuff i don't see how that is really constructive <laughs> um is if anything it's just causing a nuisance yeah in the public space it's not really solving the problem um so in my view it's not the best way to go about things. Okay. It doesn't mean that the, you know, what they're, the issues that they're raising are not valid. Valid, are, yeah. Mm-hmm. But the way you're going about it is not. And if you're, the danger is by doing these things, you're taking away from the substance of the issue because people are just going to look at you and be like, well, what's wrong with you? And then that way, they don't really get to the heart of the issue either. You probably just end up getting arrested <laughs> for causing trouble in public. And then, then, then what? Then they're released and then they do the same thing again. What is the $2 million painting that you're pouring paint on going, like what did it do to you? Yeah. That you're, you know, like that doesn't, 
really solve any issues. But I think the point of view that a lot of young people are coming from is the rich are the target for okay. this aggression, so to speak. If you can hit people where the where their money is, then mm. they will pay attention to the issues. Okay. I just don't think those are constructive ways of doing it. Okay. I don't have the answers to how they should do it because I think another part, part of the frustration for young people is nothing really has worked before. Mm. So we need to use more drastic measures. Mm. I wouldn't encourage young people and young Africans to do the same thing because also the, the cultural environments are different. Yeah, very, very different. Kind of, how do you want to sit and chain yourself to the road in, in Nigeria? <laughs> <laughs> like that's not going to, people will run you over. Oh, oh, cut, oh, cut out. <laughs> <laughs> so you can't, you know, the, there are certain things that just wouldn't work given the cultural yeah. context. And that's what I think we must be wary of just replicating what we see elsewhere because, oh, it works there. No, it won't always work yeah. where you are. But I think if we can find constructive ways, maybe, yeah. you know, and get, oh, why not open a platform, you know, open a YouTube channel about issues or yeah. write letters to, you know, different people. If you have contacts, yeah. stuff like that, instead of attacking, you know, blocking roads, attacking, d- destroying painting, stuff like that. That's what I would say. Mm. See, for me, the, yes, all those things, you just talk about you talk about yes, but my 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 frustration with them is that uh, when you try to engage with them, they are not ready to engage with you. Mm-hmm. They just want you to accept. their arguments without pushing back hmm. i mean this this i see with young africans hmm. the same kind of argument i just told you i, I just used my daughter as an example okay she, she grew up in this in this environment hmm. and she has that attitude and that tells me this is how they they learn from school and I think it's a bad thing Mm. not being not not willing not being willing to defend your position and if you're wrong take the L Mm. and become better okay again see I've talked about when it comes to cl- cl- climate change, hey, I, I study science. I love science. Uh, yes, I believe cli- climate change is real. Okay. Now, after knowing that it's real, the question is this. The next question is, what are the solutions? Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, I don't know how, what they call this, this generation, generation Z or whatever. Okay, I don't, I, I, I don't know anything about that. Okay, the younger generation only think the solution is one, is what they they propose, and they don't want to listen to people who are telling them, no, this is not correct. And I see these things in Africa already. So yeah, I've talked to a few young African climate change activists. Okay. Uh, I One of them came, went to COP26, that was two years ago in Scotland. And I, I talked to him, I talked to him after that. Okay. Now, I didn't push back. I just listened to him. Okay, and that was because I myself haven't done a lot of work to understand the the arguments. Mm -hmm. Okay, since then I've read maybe three, four books about about the arguments, and I see the arguments. Okay, 
the argument is not is not that there's no climate change. No, the the main argument is that the solutions and renewables are not the solutions if we really really want to solve climate change in the, in the next thirty years. The data, the, the, the data is clear. So those, those things are, those, this, those uh, discussions are necessary to listen to, to understand the position of others. And that's what young people in the West mostly, and also the young people in Africa do not want to do. You know, and I think it's it's uh it's counterproductive. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, old people like me and beyond is not is is it's not a a a planet. Okay, it's let's say in Africa, uh, young people like you are the majority. Okay, so and the 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 consequences of climate change will rain on you more than me, okay? Maybe I'll live uh, another 30 years, okay? I'm, if I'm lucky, yes, okay? But you guys are gonna be here, but the, 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 the problem is that, yes, you guys don't read, unfortunately. So I know you read, but I'm not, I'm talking about generally, okay? You guys don't read and uh, you guys need to find solutions, you know, so. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I mean, I think the thing is, um, I don't know, I think I, I have heard this perspective that, you know, a lot of uh, like young people don't read mm. and, and all. And sometimes, I mean, I, I wonder sometimes where that comes from because. Oh, okay. Because, you know, sometimes you would meet, there, there are a lot of people that read. Yes. I think it's just what they're reading. Maybe that's the issue. Because I think um, I think sometimes maybe the problem that adults, let's say, have is that maybe they're not reading, let's say, history. The kind, kind of things I, I, I want them to read, okay? Exactly. But, the, but they are reading. It's just that they're not reading what you would prefer that they read or what you would rather read. read. Okay. At the same time, it is true that a lot more people decide to consume video content instead of books. And so, but that doesn't, I mean... Amazon, for example, has this thing, this, um, I think, is it Audible? Yeah. There's, there's this app that you can use to read books. Yeah. But I, I, of, I, I do. I have uh, oh, okay. nearly, nearly 200 books in there. Exactly. So there are those resources now for people, because even like me, I don't like reading, to be honest really? with you. I don't like reading, but I, I recognize the importance of reading. But it doesn't, there are very few books that interest me to the point where I'm excited to pick it up. The rest of it is like a chore. I don't like reading. I'm more, oh I'm much more of a visual learner, which is why I went into videos myself. But having said that, resources like Audible and all these apps where the book can be read to you. Yeah. With the amount of things, the world is busier now. Mm. You know, people are constantly on the go. You're on the bus or on the train to work. You can be listening to these books. Yeah. There. And I find that a lot of young people actually, that's how they consume their books. They're not buying hard copy books yeah. anymore to read or they have it on their phone. So sometimes, even if you see somebody on your phone, it's like, why are you always on your phone? They could be reading. Yeah. They could be okay. reading. Okay. That, that, that's, you know, good. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. That's good. Resources. I think it's just, you know, it, it depends, obviously. But I think a lot of people are reading. I think it's just not maybe the majority of the ones we see. Don't yeah. seem to be doing that, but a lot of people are as well. I would yeah. Say. Okay, that that may be true. That may that may be true. Uh, as long as they they consume knowledge and mm. they are willing to debate their position, mm. uh, yeah, I'm I'm okay with that. All right, uh, Richard. So we are Africans, and. Uh, we both mostly agree that uh, we have a lot of work to do. Okay. Now, what are the biggest challenges 
you see with, that Africa is facing uh, this century? Well, um, I would say there are, well, uh, there are definitely sustainability and environmental issues. Okay. I would say that's like a big challenge. There's a lot of pollution, mm. a lot of, you know, oil spills, deforestation. Again, in, I, I think the the climate change conversation in Africa is very new. It's not advanced compared to like, we don't talk about it like the mm. West does. Yeah. Um, whether that's an education thing, who knows, but there's definitely, we don't seem to, and this is a generalization, but it doesn't seem to me like we prioritize it. Okay. Especially, I mean, how you, what do you want to tell people in a remote village somewhere about climate change? To them, it might not really make that much of a, might not be a big deal. To them, yeah. But there's no denying that we have a lot of pollution issues. The air quality is not the greatest in a lot of Africa. In the, in the cities, yes. So... That, that is a big issue, that, especially because Africa is the hub of the future. If we want to step up um, in, uh, manufacturing and all those things, we want more factories to open up. We need to find better sustainable ways of producing and exporting. So that's that's one challenge, I would say, the, okay. the conversation about sustainability. Um, one that I find very big, or well, there's sort of two in one. Okay. Um, not we don't focus enough on tourism and we don't preserve our history enough. okay yeah um, and that that is a big thing for me because i'm very into culture and i talk about culture a lot on my channel if i go to a new place the first thing i want to do is learn about the history and see you know the not necessarily like fun spots but just i want to i would love to go to museums yeah learn about the history and i find that one thing that western countries or well just a lot of countries outside the African continent do well is they really preserve the history. Yeah. There's, and there's no reason why we shouldn't be doing that in Africa because we have so much history as well. You know, like it's not, it's not like they have more than us. We just don't really, I don't know, maybe we haven't, we didn't see the point of preserving things or only we, we were sort of saying, okay, this is more important than this. So we don't need to focus on that. But that, that's a, it's a shame because when people come, foreigners come to visit, I always ask myself, what will I actually show, this show them yeah. when they're coming? If I go to Paris, the Eiffel Tower is there, the Louvre Museum is there, Notre Dame is there. There are all these sites from, you know, from centuries ago. Yeah. What, what in Africa do we have that? Oh, yeah, we, we have our, you know, the buildings that, you know, different empires built, some of them still stand granted but a lot of them they're not really in very accessible areas too and safety <laughs> is another big issue so to start traveling to different places but all in all this i think is just summed up under the tourism and history preservation yes, yes. challenge that i think we need to do much better of because this is how you get wiped out and you don't realize the rest hey. of the world has something to show they know where they come from they know that's their selves their culture their history we only have stories and after a while stories are going to die out as exactly generation. and that's the that's the problem so okay. we need to find a way to really we need to do something we need to do something about that okay. see th this is why this is why i always talk about writing writing books mm. see the main reason why we know so much about European history, about Arab history, about Chinese history, is because they are written down. And the, re the main reason why we don't know a lot about African history, because most of Africa didn't have written languages. Mm. see you live in the UK right now I bet you if you go to any small town any small town they have a museum if you go there if you go they, would, they have artifacts books 
that would show you and tell you their history for maybe 100, 200, 300 years. Mm -hmm. And if you go to major cities, they have a thousand year history there. Now, uh, very few African cities are as old as uh, 200 years, very few. But even those, we don't have things to show the progression. Mm -hmm. See, uh, I told you my father, he, said, he's, he studied history and he used, he used to teach history. So for some years, I've been I'm telling him to write, write history, blah, blah, blah. Because he tells me all these things. I have to write them down. And luckily, he has written one book. He just sent me a copy uh, two months ago. Uh, his mother, okay, and of course he's writing about his mother, and of course he would talk about himself and all that. So write as much as you can. Your mother, your brother, you know, because they are they are important people in your history, you know, and see. Maybe we, maybe we can start, uh, someone needs to start the, to encourage towns to have museums. I will tell you this, my hometown, Idimujo Uboko, have a website with, with history, as, as much history as possible. We have that. The genealogy, the genealogy of every family is there. And that was uh, started by two, two gentlemen in, in the UK uh, working with my dad to, to get that done. And see, we, we, need, we, need to, we need to start documenting our history. That's the most important thing. Like you said, telling stories, in fact, Yes, the story of my dad died in, in, in 100 years, but most importantly, storytelling, the stories will change from one person to the, to the other. You know, we want consistent and as much as possible, some truths. And that, that, that is done through writing yeah. so you're right sorry i just want to jump in on the on the artifacts and mm. you know, museums there is also this element of um western powers that have just taken things yeah um, because i mean the other day i went to the british museum <laughs> the british museum is literally everything a house of stolen goods from around the world yeah like you enter the africa section you see all the benin bronzes yes and I'm, I'm wondering why do we allow them to still keep all of these things in this amount till today? It, it doesn't make any sense to me. And I, I don't know what the arrangements between both countries are, but that it, does, it just doesn't sit right with me. Okay. Because when, when I'm going back to, maybe if, you know, I haven't really gone to museums in Benin, for example, in Edo State to see what they have. Yeah. Well, I, I, I had a... An artist, oh mm. God, what, what's his name now? Oh my God, on the on on the podcast, uh, and uh, he told me a lot from. He's from Benin. He's okay. he's a well, I won't call him upcoming because he's uh, he's not he's no already. Oh my God, oh God. Anyway, he told me this the 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 plan. They are going to build a museum uh, in Benin. Uh, and it will house, house all the the returned bronze, okay, yeah, artifacts from Europe. Okay, now having said that, yes, I want the return of as much as many of those artifacts as possible. But if Knowing Nigeria 
<laughs> like you know, okay? Will we keep them well? <laughs> Knowing a country like we know, mm. if those artifacts were not taken, mm. were in Nigeria, do you think anybody will see them today? <laughs> No, let, let's be honest, okay? Mm. See, for me, see, if we want things to change, we need to be honest with ourselves, mm. okay? Knowing a country the way it is today, if those things were not taken, would they be in existence today? Probably not. It's okay. not a very encouraging answer. <laughs> so, so until until we build those places okay until we have policies to honor those things mm. until we start telling ourselves our history in school and not try to erase something that doesn't look well, doesn't sound well, until we're ready to tell ourselves the truth. This is who we are. These are the things we did in the past, the good, the bad, the ugly. Because, see, why do we know about all the atrocities that Europeans have, do have done in the last 500 years is because the Europeans wrote those things down. They wrote the good, the bad, the ugly of their history until we are ready to do the same thing. For me, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want all those things to be returned until that's, that's my, 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 my own uh, view of, of this. Okay. See, I want as many of them to be returned, but not until we're ready. Yeah. And the truth, the, and the truth of, the truth of matter, matter is this. The reason why those things are in Europe is because, hey, they are spoils of war. Mm -hmm. And in the old days, before the Europeans became the big boys, spoils of wars go to the victors. Today, we can argue, we can argue with them. Why? Because they changed the dynamics that allows the conquered to be, a, to be able to argue with the victors. Hey, that's, that's a progress, mm -hmm. human progress. <laughs> and see, this, this little bit, people would not like. <laughs> no, but I mean, that, that is the reality. You yeah. know, we, we don't, and this is what I was saying, like we don't have a culture of wanting to preserve mm. things well. So it's like, what do we really have to show? And that's, I, I don't know why that is, whether we just don't think it's important or we can't be bothered or we're just focusing on more lucrative ways of making money. Mm. But that, that really is, yeah. you know, it's a so harsh we, reality. We, we, ha we, have, we have so many beautiful things to show. Yeah. So many. See, I will tell you, if you go to my region in Delta, every, every town, every village is not town, every village, okay, has incredible tradition and culture that at least we should preserve in a better, in a better way by building a, maybe a small, 
close to your your chief or your, your king build build a museum mm -hmm. and if if more of us do that across our country if someone comes from europe and the security is okay we can take them to 10, 10 villages within a region mm -hmm. and they will, they will be excitedly consume all the, the knowledge, the history of those, of those places. And you know what? They will pay the money. Mm -hmm. They will pay the money. Because say, one of the reasons why Europeans have so many active acts from Africa is because they are, in, a, in some ways, more interested in them than we, we are. Maybe because we live with it, we are the creators, so we didn't think, think anything, anything of them, you know? Yeah, so, so maybe people will listen to this and say, hey, maybe let me go to my village and start doing this, yeah. you know? You know, what is your advice? What would be your advice to young Africans to help them uh, help them do their bit to progress? the development of them, themselves first and their communities? Well, I would say um, the, the first thing I would say is just to start something. Okay. Any, any idea, no idea is useless or impractical. No matter how lofty it is, mm. you can always take something from it to implement in some way. And for me, what I found useful in my experience is always working with small communities. So whether it's a volunteer, even if you volunteer at like the motherless baby's home, yeah, or, or you know, at an, you know, any small organization or small community, go into those communities, even if it's in a village, and see how people are living, see the issues that are affecting people. You understand more than you could ever read about. Yeah. Just from hearing people's stories, from seeing the realities that you probably don't even, you're not experiencing. It puts life in a totally different perspective. And I think one thing we need in Africa is an understanding of our issues or our, our situations, our yeah. realities. Because I think that there's a disconnect as well those of us that are privileged, lucky enough, we don't really know what the average African that is struggling on like less than $2 a day is yeah, living. Yeah, we, we true. care about it. We do case studies in school about it. But what is that going to do until you go and talk and to you see person, it, or you see it, or yeah. maybe you even try to experience it yourself. Yeah. Or your situation, your circumstances change. God forbid, but still, you know, you that's when you're like, okay, this is this is something people cannot continue to live like this. Yeah. Then you begin to ask more questions. You begin to hold your leadership accountable. You begin to see what you as an individual can do in certain communities yeah. to make life, life better. You can't solve all the problems, but it, it ignites a hunger in you to change things because you realize how there's so much injustice in the world and it's not fair for people to live like that. So I would say get involved on those, you know, grassroots yeah. levels, really understand what is happening and just start something. Offer to volunteer somewhere. You don't have to create a business because yeah. I know a lot of okay. people want to create a business. <laughs> That's the, and, but you don't have to do that to be successful or to okay. change. Yeah. You can literally be part of the conversation by just getting involved, asking questions. If you can, Take a trip to a different African country or a different village, even within your country. Mm. Spend a day or two minimum. Yeah. And just so li live with the people. Live with the people and your life will change. And then yeah. you will realize, okay, we need to do something about a lot of these issues. That's, the, that's my 
two cents. I, I agree. I, 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 I wholly agree. Yes. Yes. Like I have told you, I love to read. Okay. I love to consume content. Yes, reading a big part of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, I want you to recommend five books to my audience for yeah. them to uh, get and consume for this year. The year is all, almost, uh, it's going to be six months over by tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, well, well, this this podcast is going to be uh, posted in, maybe in a week, in, in two in two weeks. Okay, so what books are you would you recommend to my audience? Well, the uh, I think the first book I would recommend is the The Alchemist. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Paulo, Paulo it's, Coelho. That's yeah. a classic. You know book that everybody i think it's very important okay um it's a good one about you know like a journey of life and self-discovery which for me is very important good um, next i would say that there's this book the can we use foul language on your on your podcast hey <laughs> it's just the title if, it's, if it is the title of the book is the title go of for it yes, yes. The, the subtle art of not giving a fuck oh okay uh, yeah by uh mark manson i believe yeah that that also is is a good one. I okay. think it, it teaches you how to deal with the stuff that life throws your way and just how to move on from that. Which okay. I think character building strength is something a lot of young people need in yes. the world because we're out of touch with reality a lot of times. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, yeah. um, the next book uh, is this one that I, I started reading, um, but I haven't really I haven't finished. It's okay. called Talking to Strangers. Mm. by malcolm gladwell okay oh okay yeah i've i've read uh about about three or four books of his yes mm -hmm. okay. yeah so that that's a good one it's quite interesting so far um i think it's it also uses like a psychological maybe even philosophical perspective yeah to analyze what people strangers are thinking when you approach them, oh, oh, yeah, them. To navigate yeah. those. Mm -hmm. so i think it's interesting um, the fourth one would be uh, this book by Elaine Aaron called The Highly Sensitive Person. Mm, okay. it's, a very, it's a very good book, especially if you mm. want to understand yourself, how to deal with emotions, how to process things. Yeah, and... it, it'll, be, it'll be very good for, 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 the, for the younger young generation, yeah. yes, because they're yeah, highly it's... sensitive. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's a, it's a great book. <laughs> and the last one is, is actually a children's book. Okay. Like, it will take you two minutes to read it. It's of those big picture books, but mm. I would recommend it. It's called I Am Human by ah, okay. Suzanne Verde. Okay. And it is, I mean, it's for children, like ages, I don't know, maybe ages three to five or something. So, so why, why do you recommend, recommend it for adults? Because me, I, I actually did a video about this on my channel, actually, yeah. why I read children's books. Because I think gen life is heavy. You know? Okay. There's a lot of stimulus that can really just muddle your thinking and stress mm. you, overwhelm you. For me personally, I find it useful to go back to basics Okay. a lot of times. And that involves going to read picture books. As I mentioned before, I'm a visual learner. Person, yes. Okay. So reading all these books that are so the print is small and there's so many words. I yeah. Get, <laughs> like, I, don't, I don't like that. So I, it's refreshing for me to see big pictures because I can mm. use my mind to imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, look at this kid. When they draw the clouds big, they, the sun is smiling. You know, you can see, yeah. and visualize the character's journey in the book. But this book is very good because for young children also, there are a lot of things that I think as you grow up, you overlook or you forget. And I like it because she reminds you, and it's good for children to grow up with this in mind already. Yeah. Now, look, you're a human being. You're not perfect but you're not useless either mm, mm, you're somewhere mm. in between and that that is the point of life the point is to keep doing what you can if you make mistakes own up and apologize if you do things well celebrate your achievements yeah but always keep being what you can be that's the journey and that for me is is such a potent reminder yes it's yep. for kids, but i love it because 
It's just like, okay, let me just calm down, remove all the big grammar, big this complex vocab, and just go back to basics. And it always helps me to reset. So Very that's good. I, I would re recommend. Very it. good. I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll get that book. Okay? Yeah, try it. See, <laughs> and then I'll, I'll put it up there. <laughs> yes, I will. I will. I will. Thank you. Of course. So uh, my last, very last question. Mm -hmm. My last question for every guest of mine. What's your vision for Africa in the next 30 years time? I would like to see an Africa where our leadership is more responsible, where we're able to stand up to Western countries and defend our values, um, but also, um, you know, like be, be wise about the, co the cooperation and the partnerships that we form, where the leaders don't do things for selfish gain, but put the people ahead okay. of their own personal gain. And I think that will reflect in policy and in the sorts of agreements that we enter with, you know, foreign powers. Um, on a more, that's something that deeply resonates with me on on a more personal level, I would love to see an Africa where there is more regional integration. Okay. Where we're able to go from country to country and really see our continent. Because I think it's one of the greatest tragedies that we have a lot of barriers mm. to exploring the continent. Yes, for a lot of it, there are reasons for a lot of it, but yeah. I think a lot of it still is kind of, is we're, we're complicating the problem for ourselves. Yeah. yeah. There's no reason, in my opinion, why I should be I should need a visa and a very strict visa process mm. to go to another African country when I have legitimate reasons to travel there. Yeah, there's I think a lot of people don't they don't have a clue. A lot of Africans they don't have a clue about what other African countries are like. So all the only information they have is stereotypes, all these narratives online, fake news, different things without actually seeing it for themselves. Yeah. How can you expect the country, the continent to grow when you have those barriers in place? You know, you look at the EU, for example, and how there's there's great ease of movement, relatively speaking. And the yeah. EU, I like looking at the EU because they do a lot of these cross-cultural programs, like the Erasmus program, where you can have kids from students from Greece going to study in Portugal for a certain amount of time. Then before you know it, they're going to Czech Republic to study again. And I I saw this when I was living in Greece for four months doing an internship. Okay. And a lot of the people I interacted with were doing Erasmus, Erasmus. And I just came back from Spain last week. Actually. I did an Erasmus program. And I was just asking myself, I'm like, these are the sorts of things Africa should have. Yes. You can go here. You're funded to study here, spend a week, do a training. Yeah. Go can, back I, can, I make, can, can I say something about that? Yes. Yeah. The Africa, the European countries has been on the journey of integration for over ne nearly 2,000 years. Mm -hmm. Nearly 2,000 years. Okay. At the beginning of the first uh, crusade, that's uh, 10 something, right? People from different areas of Europe were involved. That tells you one thing. They already know about the, each other, okay, for centuries. Unfortunately, we haven't done that. We didn't even know very few of African empires knew that in the West, knew that the one in the East existed mm -hmm. 500, 500 years ago. So the integration is highly lim limited. Mm -hmm. Now, knowing that we See, this is how we started, and uh, this is how I'm going to finish. Knowing these things, our leaders 
we should consciously understand the limitations we have and consciously work to break them down. Mm -hmm. And that's what we haven't done. So this is it. See, I agree. We need, we need more integration. We need to be able to travel to other regions. But I'm just say, saying to you, these are the reasons, these are the, 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 the barriers mm -hmm. that we face. And we need to be conscious to break them down. Yeah. All right? So that's it. So this, these things are the things we need to talk, we need to be able to talk about over and over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right? So Richard, yes. thank you very, very, very much thank you as well. for being a great guest of the Think Big for Africa podcast. Thank you. I've really, I've enjoyed the discussion. Thank you for having me. Take care, man. Thank you. You too. Bye. Bye.